So we're going to go on to the next cycle. So we have Robbie kind of sliding around, surfing, moonwalking, uh, doing some pretty, pretty weird stuff currently. And one thing you notice is that the camera doesn't actually follow Robbie. Actually, you know, let's pause, because I had promised that we were going to talk about play mode real quick. Because that's important. So real quick, I, again, I almost forgot. Raise your hand if the play buttons in your uh, editor happen to be blue right now. All right, so this is a little gotcha we want to talk about real quick, just for those of you who may not know or maybe new or whatever. When you enter play mode, these buttons turn blue, right? So you're in play mode now. Play mode's great for testing out our games, for iterating, prototyping, all that stuff. However, uh, there's a, a couple caveats, right? So maybe while I'm in play mode here, I might be thinking to myself, uh, man, I'd love it if the, the camera was over here or, you know, Robbie uh, did something completely different. Or maybe Robbie, I just don't like Robbie at all anymore, and so I just want to get rid of him. I'll just even straight delete the game object. You know what? I actually don't like any of this. I'll just delete everything, whatever. Right? I can do this because as soon as I leave play mode, it all comes back. Play mode is a sort of safe environment for testing. The problem comes that if you enter play mode and you're testing some stuff, and you know what, maybe, uh, maybe you pause the game, and now you're back to just you know, working or whatever, and you don't realize that you're in play mode. Because the really only indicator is those blue buttons at the top. And so you actually do real work, stuff you want to keep, make a bunch of changes. You work for a couple hours. And then you go, oh, let me try this in play mode. And you hit the button. You leave play mode, and you've lost all of your work. And you don't even know how much you've just lost, all right? There's good and bad to how play mode works, right? So we're going to do something real quick. We're all going to do this together, so it's not like a learning cycle thing. You can just do this with me. We're going to set up a play mode tint so that this will not be a problem anymore. So what I'm going to have you all do, and you can all just do this right now, I'm going to go to Edit and then Preferences. On a Mac, you'd go to the Unity and then Preferences. So I'm going to select Preferences here. And when the Preferences window opens up, I'm going to go to Colors. And the one I care about is Play Mode Tint. Now I'm going to set this to something obnoxious. Uh, I generally like uh, 255, 0, 255. My favorite. This hot fuchsia magenta color there. And the reason we set this is now, if I'm in play mode, there's no way that I don't know I'm in play mode. Like, I see this, and I'm like, OK, I am definitely in play mode. I know that, OK, I should leave play mode before making any changes. All right, and again, you access that from Edit, and then Preferences, and then Colors. A fun little uh, tip, you can always just set uh, the color to solid black. And then uh, on someone else's computer, by the way, so that when they hit play, they think Unity crashes or locks up, and they're like, "Ah, oh, this is stupid. Nah, this is, why this does is it keep... the Dark Souls version? Yeah, of why the does editor. this keep locking up on me?" Uh, the only downside is it's really hard to find the play button to come back out of it. There we go. Um, so that's fun to do on other people's computers. But otherwise, just setting some some really obnoxious uh, color there, you know, making it really impossible to not know that you're in play mode and in whatever. Um, for the sake of saving everyone's eyeballs up here, I'm just going to set this back to default. But definitely set up a play mode tint. That way, as you're in play mode, you, you, know, you know you're in play mode. You're not making any changes. I've had people before sit through a full eight-hour long workshop. At the end of the day, they hit play to try their game out. They were in play mode the whole day. They left play mode, and they had an empty scene. And they were like really mad at me, like it was my fault. So now we just make sure that everyone sets a play mode tint so this doesn't happen anymore. So. Definitely do that again. Edit preferences and then colors, uh, or Unity preferences and then colors. If you're on a Mac, set up some play mode tint uh, so that uh, you know you don't accidentally make that mistake. All right, back to you, Andy. Cool. So we currently have so going into play mode. Thank you, Michael or Mike. We have here Robbie, and I can move around with the arrow keys, jump, crouch, jump, do all that fun stuff. Now the trouble is, is Robbie goes off camera. This is quite a common problem. Because we want to create a platformer or a level that's bigger than our camera um, area or frustrum. So as you can see here in the scene view, we've got this kind of we've got this square, and it's basically showing what the camera is rendering in the game view. But it's not following Robbie. Robbie can run around and do all this stuff all day, but the camera's not following him. So you want to set up this camera to follow Robbie. We could write hundreds and hundreds of lines of code to do this. We're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to use a tool uh, in Unity called Cinemachine. And this sets up camera rigs and allows you to very quickly set up cameras to have different behaviors or follow different targets or do different things. Real quick, Andy, why wouldn't you just set the camera as a child of Robbie? 
Good question, Mike. Thank I'll you. I'll find out. <laughs> so if you just set the, the, uh, the, the camera as just a child of Robbie, you'll do this. Running right is fine. But now it jumps. Because it's a child of Robbie, basically as Robbie flips or Robbie like uh, scales or moves in a different direction, it's going to keep that offset of that camera. And it's also going to be very rigid. So you notice that as Robbie moves, he's always going to be in the center of the screen. With Look how no boring that is. Really. There's no inertia. There's no catch up. You know, you want to run and have the camera follow. You want to have some nice smoothing. You want to keep the camera like in the screen. So you notice here we have this blue area here. You want to clamp that so you don't see all that horrible off screen stuff. Yeah, that's why not. This is, this is the lazy way of making a camera rig. And we're not lazy, we're, we're going to be efficient. We're professionals. Absolutely. So the first <laughs> thing I'm going to do You can sound is, more convincing. Yeah. The first thing I'm going <laughs> to do is going to go to the main camera. I'm going to set this up so we no longer have this blue area. This is like the default blue background that a Unity camera has. Now, we could go in, or I could go in, and paint tons of shadows everywhere. Instead, I'm going to cheat because I'm a little bit lazy, and I'm going to set the camera background to be black. We could set this to anything we want. We could set this to be like violent green. It depends on the type of game you want, but because we have this shadow area here, this dark shadowy area. Yep, that's right. That's the light, what the Lion King was talking about. Yeah. We have this background color to black. The other thing I'm going to do, this is before we do all the Cinemachine stuff, is to change the projection from orthographic, which is quite typical in 2D games and platformers, to perspective. And you'll notice that as I change this, the camera kind of pulls out a little bit. And you notice that that big square is now a massive kind of pyramid. And what this is doing is it's changing the camera from instead of rendering everything without depth, it's now going to have some depth. So at the top here, you might have noticed that we've been in 2D mode the entire time. And if we disable 2D mode or switch out of 2D mode into 3D mode, oh, we've been making a 3D game all along. How magic is that? Sneaky. Sneaky, yeah. And you'll notice here that we have Robbie, and each of the layers have a very slight gap in them. They're slightly offset, which means that we kind of have instant parallax scrolling, because rather than rendering everything as like a without depth and as a long sort of square frame, we instead have the depth from the camera. So this is kind of like I, every time I, I visit students or to, to students, they always ask one of the most big questions is, how do I make parallax scrolling in my 2D game? I've been asked it a million times. You just set your camera to perspective and offset things. Ta-da, no code. You instantly have parallax scrolling. How amazing is that? I will now no longer be asked that question. <laughs> that would well, be, actually, I, I doubt that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and as you notice, as I'm in 3D mode and I switch back to orthographic, you'll notice that the camera frustrum switches from this corridor. Well, this corridor is the orthographic setting to perspective. So we now have kind of like how our eyeballs see things with depth. OK, so we have our camera set up. It's very simple. Oh, I have my camera set up. Next, I'm going to add Cinemachine. So to do that, there's this Cinemachine already imported into this project. Ah, oh, yes, and go back to 2D mode. Thank you, Mike. So I have here this Cinemachine drop down in the menu. And we have tons of different camera rigs here. And you're going to see some cool Cinemachine stuff in the keynote later. And there's various talks and all sorts of things on this. I'm not going to go through every single camera rig, because it will take too long. But instead, I'm going to go to this one at the very bottom, which is 2D camera. There's a dedicated camera rig for 2D games. So if I select this Create 2D Camera, a couple of things happen. One is that this camera will go completely black. Another one is it will go kind of red. We have these red lines now. Another one is a little icon will actually appear next to the main camera. What that's doing is it's setting up the cinema machine, it's setting up the main camera to have a brain. And this brain is going to be listening out to which cinema machine camera it's currently using. Because you can have one camera rendering your game and many different cinema machine cameras that are used for cutscenes or themes in your game or different levels and things like this. And what this brain does is it kind of passes the main camera between these different rigs. So when you go into a cutscene, it goes to an over-shoulder shot. And when you go into, say, another room, you'll have a camera pants to another area. It's kind of like a baton. A baton. 
He says, baton. It's, <laughs> it's kind of like a baton being passed in a relay race, like the camera's being passed between these different camera rigs. We're going to keep it simple and just have one camera rig. So if I go to my Cinemachine camera, you'll notice it's rendering nothing. We obviously want it to render Robby. And there's a ton of settings here. People keep asking us to add more sliders to Unity, so we keep doing that. And one thing you'll notice is that in this Cinemachine camera, we have follow and look at. We want it to follow Robbie, so I'm just going to assign Robbie, and it will snap to here. So you notice that without that, oh, hang on. Actually, I'm not going to be able to get it. Yeah, that'll just it. keep its spot, but that's fine. We're going to follow Robbie. So wherever Robbie goes, this camera will follow it. We also don't want to set look at to anything. It's a 2D game. We don't want the camera rotating at all. We want to just look straight ahead, but follow the positions of our character. Another thing I'm going to do is go down, uh, down the cinema sheet, whoop, down the cinema sheet virtual camera. You notice there's a ton of settings. I'm not going to go through all these because this would take like 10 hours, and Mike will get really mad because we don't go the rest of the workshop. But there's one really important one for 2D called camera distance. And this is how far the camera is from our scene, or from the target it is following. You notice that as we change this, which we can scrub here, like clicking camera distance and set it, we can set how much we're showing and revealing of the level. And you notice because the main camera background is black, it's always going black. I don't have to paint thousands of tiles. And the setting we want to set it, or I'm going to set it to, is 15. That's about the right distance. And you can obviously play with this later on, but I'm going to use 15. And the very last thing that I'm going to do is... Save your scene. Save my scene, yes, of course is go to the Cinemachine camera, and I like neatness and things to be named properly, so instead of CMVCam1, you'll be working with someone, they have I no idea what this camera's supposed to do. I'm gonna rename this to Player Follow Cam. This is the camera following the player, because with Cinemachine you might have many different cameras doing different things. So that's a couple of steps. I'm just gonna go through the, super quickly what I did, and then obviously it's your turn. So I went to the main camera, which will already be in your scene, and set the background to black. You can obviously set it to wherever you want, red, green, blue, but it's going to be wrong. It should be black. Then you I'm going to do whatever you want. Yeah, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. Why are we here? <laughs> <laughs> then change the projection from orthographic, which is kind of the 2D camera setup, with no depth to perspective, so there is depth. Then at the top, we have the Cinemachine drop down. Don't choose any of the other camera rigs. Someone's bound to do it. Don't do it, please. Choose the Create 2D Camera. Rename it to player follow cam, um, just to keep things neat and organized. Tell it to follow Robbie, our character, and then set the camera distance to 15. So we pull it out just a little bit. And if I go into play mode now, what you'll notice is that Robbie, the camera will actually follow Robbie, but it will be slightly offset. So you notice that wherever Robbie goes, the camera will follow very slow, slightly. But you notice that the camera isn't perfectly following Robbie. It's slightly offset. So rather than it being locked to Robbie, it kind of has a, like, a little bit of a delay behind it. And you can obviously play with the Cinemachine camera to like, predict where Robbie's going to be and do all this cool stuff. But the default setting is pretty cool in that we now have Robbie able to move around without the camera being too jerky or um, moving around too quickly. So we can even go up here, and then the camera rig's going to follow. So switching back to the slides. This is step 5A. There is step 5B, but we're going to do that after this is all set up. 